what I want to do is is give you a little bit of an opportunity to follow us um, both in the terms of the newsletter. So if you haven't signed up, you can go to Groxio slash newsletter. That's where we're going to make these announcements. Alternatively, if you're following us on Twitter, you'll get access to the, the sign up pages as they come up. But the goal is to make them available first on the newsletter. And we're only ever going to have 100 sign up slots. And um, this time we, um, we got about 60. So if you do the math, if, if, we, if we grow at about 20 or 30%, you're probably okay following on the Twitter, but over time you're gonna to wanna to be on the newsletter. So if you wanna go deeper, we're, we're kind of priced for the international market already. An annual subscription that gives you access to everything on our site is about $150 US. Um, we're working on how to make that more accessible to, um, to places where the dollar is not quite, is, or is, is a little bit too strong. Um, we're, it's gonna take us a while to get there. So, but if you want to buy an individual lesson, they run around 70 bucks and we have them for Flux and Julia. And later we're gonna have versions for Ecto and NX and also for computer vision as well. And that's also gonna be done in Julia. So right now we're going to be talking about um, machine learning math in the context of Julia. And we're doing that because it's a mathematically elegant language where the math that we are interested in is mirrored very closely in the language. And we're going to be talking about specifically in flux. What I'd like to do is do a little bit of slideware or whatever you call it these days, a presentation. And then I'd like to break away for a few live coding demos as we go. And today's live coding demos are going to be something in something called the Pluto Notebook, which is a Julia notebook, which allows you to actually take notes and run code all in the same place, okay? And I'll, I'll try to make that notebook available over time. Um, no promises as to when I'll get it to you. I'll talk briefly about this. And then I will um, stop the screen share for a second just to kind of look at your faces as we talk about this. But the idea is that a machine learning model is a generic function. I'm going to say that again. A machine learning model is a generic function. And as you can imagine, if we create this thing randomly, it's going to make pretty terrible predictions, right? But what we'd like to do is to take some observations of data. Maybe the observations are things about a house and house prices, right? And then if we can't gather a whole bunch of those, feed them into the model, and then we basically look at how the model does predicting outcomes, right? So taking information about a house and predicting a price and doing enough of those um, enough times and then making tweaks to the individual function. And you could think of a function as something that has arguments or parameters and think about those parameters as knobs and levers on a control panel. Can everybody dust off your high school algebra? All right, so there's a, there's a formula for a line. What is it? Mx plus b? Mx plus b, right. So if we had a, if the slope was four, now what's the formula? Mx. So which is four, four x? Four x. Yeah. yeah, and then if the bias is two, what's the formula? Plus two. Two plus two, yeah. Okay, so this is a formula, right? And which is cool. And so let's say that in in all, so what is this? F of X, oh, <laughs> did you guys see that elixir sneak into my Julia? <laughs> all right, here we go. So uh, yeah, now I have an, a generic function, right? And, and what's cool is that this function looks exactly like what it does, right? So you could, you could put it like a, a times in here or whatever you want to, right? But this is 4x plus 2, right? And let's say that we want a couple of values to throw at this, right? And so maybe we want to say, um, maybe we want to throw, let's, 
let's actually tweak this. No, no, we're going to leave that alone. So let's say that we want to throw some values at this. So let's say the X values that we want are everything from zero to five, right? And so any, any guesses as to what this is? What is zero to five? A range, a range of values. Range. No, it's a range, right? And so let's say, so this is going to give me a vertical list of rows and in Julia, vertical and horizontal matter. And in fact, my modeling library right here and my plot library here expect different things. <laughs> We're going to favor the flux one. So, um, you know, horizontally, we want all the X's. So we need to concatenate, concatenate those together, right? So I'm going to say hcat zero to five, but this is going to just send an array. And what we want is five different parameters. So what we're going to do is flatten that out, right? So this basically says hcat zero comma one, two, three, four, five, right? And so this ought to give me a horizontal list. And there it is, zero through five, that's great. And we can plot it. And so how do I get the y's? Well, I could just call the f, right? So this is going to break, right? And the reason that this is going to break is that um, it doesn't know, this function doesn't know how to handle, you know, this is, this is times, which is a different kind of multiplication. And this is going to try to add a scalar, and that won't work. But what I can do in Julia is that, right? So that's a broadcast. So now I have applied the formula to all of these all these integers, right? Okay, and we can plot it. X, Y, and this is not gonna work. Why? What did I tell you? About my plotting library and my model library. They need different things. They need different things, right. So we need to transpose this. I'll let that catch up. So that's still working. Yeah, but it didn't work. We predicted that though. We're ready for it though, and so all we're going to do is transpose it, right? And this says, make your y's x's and your x's y's, right? So here we go. We're going to plot this. There's my line, right? So how do I predict this? Well, it turns out I'm going to build a model. And the model is going to be something called dense. And I'm going to have one input and one output. And this is going to implement a formula called mx plus b. Right? And all versions of machine learning are going to take the same kinds of that formula, right? Okay, so now we have the model, and then I could say, let's say I can throw model of x. This is my prediction. <laughs> so that looks exactly like the other function, right? No, it doesn't. It's horrible, right? So let's give it a couple of X's. Actually, we want the same X, right? And let's give it a couple of Y's, right? So we have Y and then the model of Y or the model of X, right? So this is the actual values that we want. This is our prediction, but that's not right, right? We have to transpose that thing. Here we go. And so here's what our prediction looks like. So it's not too bad, but this is random. So if I stick a lot around long enough, so let's run that again. Let's run. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to create the model again, right? So let's run this again, run this again, run this again, run this again. These are random, right? So all it's doing is my model has M, which we're going to call my weights, right? And it also has the bias, which is going to call B, right? So now I can see the model's weight and the bias, right? And so this is pretty terrible, and this started at zero. 
but we can make this better over time by making predictions, right? And that's what machine learning is all about. We're gonna throw it into a training algorithm and the algorithm is going to use something called autograd or auto diff, which means differential equations to do that work, right? And what a differential equation does is it essentially calculates a slope and it, it, it calculates the slope at one of your, your parameters, right? And so by, by taking tiny steps and calculating like a training step over and over, I can move my, my result. I can make my result closer and closer to, to what I'm looking for. So what do I need to do that? Well, it turns out that I need an objective and the objective is called the loss. So the loss function is gonna be in terms of X's and Y's, right? So the loss of X and Y is there's, I'm gonna, I don't wanna write my own loss function. I'm gonna write one called the sum of the squares dot losses dot M S E. So sum S of the squares um, mean squared error, right? And then I'm gonna take the average of that and then I'm going to take, um, so I'm gonna take, uh, so the model of X, right? So this is the predictions and my actual values are in Y, right? Right, so I ought to be able to run this function as an empirical step to tell me how bad this is, this function is for this piece of data, right? So x, y. So think of this as how bad is it, right? And we need a way to tweak the arguments in this function, in this, and remember, a model is just a function to make it better and better, right? So what we're gonna do is we're going to take that function and we're going to build something called an optimizer. And so it turns out that the derivative, the thing that I talked about, the AD, automatically calculates derivatives, which is the most expensive and the most important part of this process. And it turns out that other developers were doing this for a long time for numerical computing. And the machine learning folks found out about it late, but it's, it turns out that this technique is really interesting. It has a name, it's called gradient descent. So I'm gonna say, build me an optimizer sir, that uses gradient descent and okay. And it's telling me that I'm gonna take small steps in 0 0.1 increments because the line's not always gonna be straight, right? And it's not always gonna be one dimensional. So the optimizer is gonna take care of those things for me. And what I'm gonna do is say, okay, so now I have the optimizer, I have a loss function. I need to throw it some training data, but I already have some training data. So I have the X's, right? And what's in the X right now? Zero through five. Zero through five, that's right. And what's in the Y? Uh, the formula. Yeah, the formula, right? The results of the formula. And we just piped in those X's. So we got 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, and 22, right? So, and think about the X's as maybe the house and all the information about a house. Maybe we just, maybe it is so closely correlated around square foot. And maybe I'm just doing all the houses in one area. Maybe all I need is one argument. And using that, I can predict the price. Usually machine learning is overkill for that. And so now I want to save my data. Okay, so now I have data. I have an objective, right? That loss function. I have an optimizer. Now I need the knobs and levers that I can turn. So what are the knobs and levers that I can turn on my model? There are two parameters that I can change. Uh, I'm be... The weight and the bias right? It's these guys right here. So there's a convenient way to get those parameters like that. Okay, so now this should come up with, um, with a weight and a bias. 
right? So now I could say terrain. And what do I pass it? Well, I need to give it an, an objective. What's my objective? The function. The that loss works. function, right? It wants to make the loss smaller. Make that smaller, right? And what are the knobs and levers? The params. Right, P. And what is the data? Well, it's data, right? It's in this shape. And, and you know, typically there are, there can be, typically there's one set of data that you pass at it, but you might have different sets of data for, for different reasons. And, um, and then the last thing that I need is what? The optimizer? The optimizer, right? So the optimizer says, what technique do I use to make this loss smaller? And so what it's going to do is it's going to say, OK, so we have this, all these x's, and it's going to compute the sum of the difference between the expected value and the actual value. And it's going to add them up, and it's going to take the mean. So that's going to give me a function, right? And what Flux is going to do is calculate the derivative or auto differentiate that function and give me the slope at one tiny place and then work down that line and say, this is what the new parameters are going to be. And since I'm just moving this small little chunk at a time, uh, where's my optimizer? There. I'm only going to apply I'm only going to multiply the differences, the proportion times 0 0.1, and we're going to tweak them by that much. So what does this look like? So I'm going to run the training step. Uh, train not defined because I didn't use it, right? OK, so this is going to churn for a little while. Not that long, did it? Let's see if it likes me now. Okay, so it looks like that's running and it normally won't run this this long. This is an incremental compiler. So we just have to run the compile on this step. But what's gonna happen is it's going to, the, train, the training algorithm is going to apply that. And now if we run this loss function again, what was it last time? 208. 187, right? So I bet that that means that this is gonna look a little bit better. It's a little bit better, right? And so now we're going to run it again. There's 8, 10, just for good measure. Let's run the loss. Now it's at 111, right? Do the plot. You see how it's coming closer and closer into line? So that's with two parameters. Now, the typical machine learning problem can have hundreds, right? Especially with things like image recognition. And you can imagine that having just a single dimensional input isn't going to be enough, right? All right, so now we have this model. So we're going to train it. And we're going to, we're going to as part of the training step, we're going to make an evaluation. And what was the function that did the evaluation? Loss. Loss, yes. And, and, and yeah, and optimize does, takes that loss and tweaks the knobs and levers. And we do that in a loop over and over. And we, I showed you with a simple line, this can happen with multiple layered systems, right? Okay, so you saw the demo. So what, what we're going to do is rather than a very simple network like that one, we're going to use something called a neural network. Now, some programmers glaze over when they see this, but it's not that complicated, right? The whole concept in machine learning is to take one one complex function or a function that generates complex behaviors and construct it against hundreds or even thousands of very simple functions that I can churn on really, really quickly, right? And the thing that's going to make it work is this concept of a neuron. It's not a real neuron. It's just a neuron is a function. And a function has inputs and outputs. So you might have noticed that our dense layer had one input and one output, mx plus b, right? But you can imagine if we were playing the fizzbuzz game, we might have we might have four inputs, right? You might want to give the machine uh, learning prediction um, algorithm four features to help it out a little bit. 
Are you divisible? Or I'm sorry, three features. Are you divisible by three? Are you divisible by five? And are you divisible by 15? Right? And then you might have four output features. So, but you could have fizz, buzz, fizz, buzz, and else, depending on whether the number is uh, divisible by three, five, 15, or, um, or not at all, right? Remember the neurons are just functions, right? And the function has this format. This is exactly what we saw in the demo, right? Your, your high school algebra or even grade school algebra these days for some students, it's WX plus B where W is a weight or slope and B is a bias. Right, so think about the weight as the strength of the connection um, for one particular um, range, and think of B as something that moves a whole prediction for a whole layer, right? Just like it moves a line up and down. Okay, and so since the inputs can be multiple dimensional, rather than having a single a single dimensional input, we have a multi-dimensional input, right? So these things are called tensors. And these tensors are going to keep multi-dimensional data and they're going to um, flow through the system, right? And so each one of those is a function that looks like this, right? So um, you might have, rather than a single weight, we have a bunch of weights and um, each individual piece of the function implements the weight for that, that feature. So for example, we might, for a visual system, we might have a feature for red, green, and blue. And a really simple visual detection al algorithm that could tell the difference between apples and bananas might need nothing but color, right? Red, green, and blue. And it recognizes the combinations and predicts apple or banana, right? Okay, and so the change that I made in this function, did you see it? That dot is the broadcast. That's that broadcast that you saw earlier for the functions, right? So that means that we're going to add not just one bias, but maybe several biases, right? And so what's gonna happen is that we can now have multiple layers that we chain together, right? Since a function, since a model is just a function, I could take one function and I could wrap that in, in a layer, right? And so you could see that each layer has its own w, wx plus b. And then there's this other function called an activation layer, right? And the activation layer is the way that I handle nonlinear input. Okay. And so what happens when you apply the multiplication and addition and the activation functions across all the layers, it starts to operate like one big fat network with complex connections between them, right? And all we have to do is follow the rules of matrix arithmetic. And we'll get to those in a second, right? So if you're building a, a Prediction, all you're doing is chaining together F, G, and H. That's it. And then the network itself, the rules of linear algebra, let you do matrix uh, multiplication, matrix addition, and broadcast addition, and broadcast um, activation functions, which we'll get to later. Right? OK. So. What happens is that activation function, so right now, all we're doing is talking about things that can handle a specific set of, set of problems called a linear regression. And the thing that linear, aggress uh, linear regressions have in common is that, well, they predict linear problem spaces. And linear means in a line somehow, right? And so there's a, there's a function that you can apply. If you apply it to your neural networks, it allows the functions to, um, and depending on the activation function that you choose, you can get certain nonlinear behaviors. Like for example, these, these problems tend to be probabilistic. 
So when you, if you're following Roxio, one of the things once we get to computer vision, you're going to see that the Julia framework says, hey, um, I predict that this, this image that you gave me is, is an African elephant. And that's true 80% of the time, right? It's a probabilistic model. And um, probabilistic models need a certain, a certain classification of activation functions. OK, so a neural network is a model made up of neurons, which are just functions. And those functions might work on scalar input, like we just saw. But more likely, they're going to work on tensors. They're going to be multidimensional input. And since they're just functions, we can chain them together with layers, and we can connect the layers with the rules of linear algebra or some other types of rules. And we can make the outputs nonlinear with the use of an activation function. OK, so let's say, so what was the function, what was the type of layer that we used last time? The dense. We use the dense layer and dense, all dense means is that it is fully connected. And so we had how many inputs and how many outputs? One and one. So or what if we had about six, six? No, we had, we had one, you're right, one and one, right? So what if we had two inputs and three outputs? So I'm going to put one layer. Don't get confused about this and the dense of two and three. It basically means that we have one MX plus B, but this is now a matrix, right? So when I let this fly, I can say, how do I get the weights out of that thing? The params? Yeah, the params is a great way to do it. So let's do params one layer. So one of the ways that I could get the weights out would be to say one layer dot W and the bias is one layer dot B. But params will give me both, right? So I'm going to let that fly. And look, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So this is going to be a grid with, it turns out two columns and three rows. Um, that's that's the way that we'll we'll um, calculate the weights and the uh, and uh, for the biases, they're one two three. Go ahead. Uh, so a minute ago we said we were creating a dense layer with two inputs and three outputs, and now you're talking about columns and rows. Does that mean that the the inputs are usually modeled as columns and the outputs as rows? Uh, so basically, it just is the way that the, the matrix alter, uh, algebra works out, right? So basically, yes, um, inputs, the way this is going to work out is that um, when we chain things together, the number of inputs in the next layer has to match, the number of uh, outputs in one layer has to match the number of inputs in the next layer. Um, but this basically means that we'll take two um, features in, in as many observations as we want to pass in. So for example, um, let's say that I have a, um, let's say I have inputs. Um, let's say that uh, the inputs, so this is two features, right? So that means that we have to have one, one comma two, right? So this means that I have one observation that's two, that is one column and two rows, right? Um, and then so I can feed in. So now I can feed in. So we're getting a little bit ahead, but that's okay. I could feed this in and this ought to work just fine, right? Yeah, so this this gave me a, a reading. And I can also feed in more than more than one of these, right? One, one. So this is one row. That's two rows. And I think it's better if I make that a semicolon. I think it's actually required. OK, yeah. So now it's told, it's told me that, um, that when I take these inputs and I feed them in, um, I, get, I get several outputs, right? And the way to read this is every column is one 
is a different observation and every row is a feature of the output, right? So very often we'll normalize these and these will be, um, these will be, for example, the probability of an African ele elephant, the probability of an Indian elephant and so on and so forth, right? And this would be the first picture, the, fir the second picture, the third and so forth. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump back into the presentation a little bit and we're gonna catch you up on what the data is gonna look like, right? So what we did is we took some data and then we fed it into a model and then we made the, then we made the model better by with a training step, right? And that gave us better and better predictions. So let's look at the model as a function m of x, right? And so now let's think about the dimensions of my inputs and my outputs. So the first thing that makes this thing a neural network is the idea of layers, right? So if you look at a net or even a network, there are multiple nodes in the layers, right? So we can have a single dense layer, we could have multiple dense layers, right? And each one of those has its sets of weights and biases, right? So the second thing is that we can pass more than one observation in, right? So um, it's very common to take a, a snapshot of the whole set of training data and pass that whole chunk in or all the training data at once or even a batch of it to tailor um, to train a, um, a neural network. So then you can expect that the output becomes multi-dimensional as well, right? And so let's look a little bit at what the multi-dimensional part means, right? So um, we have weights, inputs, and biases, and then we have multi-dimensional operators as well. And so I'm gonna skip the next demo um, and hopefully we'll get to a little bit of the math of the matrix multiplication. So then we can pick up on the optimization in the next, in the next time, in the next time. But so the idea behind being multi-dimensional is that we have operators that can handle multi-dimensional data, right? So the way that this happens is that we have matrix multiplication. And so let's do a little matrix multiplication in Julia, right? Actually, let's do it here. This would be better. So let's say that I have a, um, a matrix with one, two, three, four, and five, and six. So there was a question about the dimensions and that, that it didn't look like they quite lined up the way you expected them to. What turns out, that the number of columns on your left has to match the number of rows on your right. And we'll look at why this is true in a second. But if, um, so if I have two rows here, so for example, I have a, um, a matrix that's um, one and then two. So this, and this one, the first row is one, two, the next row is three, four, the next row is five, six. And this is a vertical one where the first where the first row is one, the next one is two. And so semicolon. Um, oh. This uh, this this will actually work. And let's see what it gave me. Um, yeah. So um, we'll look at how this calculation happened, but this is the result, right? So um, the way well we'll we'll look at how this happens, but but I can do matrix multiplication. And it's really, really has to do with, um, with sums and weights. And we'll talk about that in a second. But then there's this idea of a broadcast, right? So I can have this one, two, three, four, and five and six. And I can add, let's say I wanted to add the one, two, and this is vertical, right? So uh, one comma two, um, this is vertical. If I wanted to make it horizontal, I would make it like that. But it turns out I can add one and two to, um, to all of the, you know, I need to one, two, and three, don't I? Yeah. 
I can add one, two, and three to every single column like this. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, so the first column was one, three, five, and one plus one is two, three, or I'm sorry, <laughs> one plus one is two, three plus two, is five and five plus three is eight. There you go. Okay, so let's look about, let's look at how those operations work. Okay, so let's do the matrix. Let's do the broadcast first, right? So if I wanna add this three dimensional vector, if I want to add this one to everything in that in that uh, in that two dimensional vector, this is going to be two, three, and four. I just add one all the way across, right? And if I want to add, and if I want to add the one two to the one two three four five six like that. I'm basically adding the vertical pieces together, the vertical numbers together. So if you if you track the one and the one, that's a two, the four and the two is a six, right? And then the next column is the one plus two and five plus two. And the next column is the three plus six and the one plus two, right? Okay. And so the matrix multiplication is a little bit more complicated and I'm going to spend just a little time here and then we'll break it. Um, and we'll break it for the next webinar. This is the, the last concept that we're going to cover today. So the whole idea is let's say that Anne is shopping for nuts, eggs, and figs. Why? Because those are very narrow. <laughs> those are three letter things, right? Um, and turns out that um, that nuts, eggs, and figs at the first store cost nine dollars, one dollars, and three dollars each. So how do I roll up the total cost? Well, I'm going to multiply the nuts times the um, the ends, the the nuts times the quantity, and the eggs, the dollars times the quantity for the eggs, and the dollars times the quantity of the figs. Right. So that should be nine dollars plus zero dollars plus six dollars, which gives me a total of 15, right? Clear so far? Let's add another dimension. So let's say that Bob is also shopping for nuts, eggs, and figs. And Bob wants zero bags of nuts, three cartons of eggs, and one bag of figs. And so the left column we've already done. So let's shift to the right column. So zero. Is that right? Yeah, that's actually right, right? Zero times nine, three times one, and one times three. Okay, so you can see my Texas roots there, Vanessa and, um, and David. There's the H-E-B. And then my Memphis roots for the Kroger, right? So, um, so the Kroger, we could process these, these bits of data the same way, right? So the Kroger, I would, I would multiply this column times that row. And for the second, the second column of the Kroger, that's going to be Bob's entry, right? So if you think about it, this matrix multiplication starts to make a single Wx plus B work like more like a something with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And that's how I get a single layer, right? And then all I do is chain layer after layer after layer together with, um, with where the inputs of one are based on the outputs of another. Right. Okay. I want to cover one more thing. I want to cover one more thing, and that's the dimensions. So there was a question on dimensions. Was that you, Keith, or who asked the question on dimensions? Yeah, I think that was. That was okay. Great. 
So basically, it turns out that the number of columns on of the input on the left has to match the number of rows on the input in the right, right? But when I show you the dense layer, that's the number of inputs and the number of outputs, right? So all they did was try to work the math all the way through and make the dimensions of the weights match. That's it, right? And so what does it look, look like? So if I'm multiplying, if I'm multiplying two, um, two rows times three columns like this, I'm going to get um, a one by three out, and the number of row, a number of columns and number of rows have to match, right? And so the way to think about the result, the size of the result is this, right? So if I have two rows and one column, it doesn't really matter how many how many observations are in the number and the rows on the left or the columns on the right. What you do is you kind of superimpose them one over another, and you can see the dimensions, right? And intuitively, the length of the two has to be the same for us to be able to do the operations that we just did, right? So let's work another one. So if I have five rows and I multiply it by something with three columns, well, the width has to match, right? So that's that's the um, you know the the number of observations has to match, and this is going to be the size of the result, right? Okay, so I think that that's most of what I wanted to cover today, but I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to take a few questions before I wrap up. So it's all moving really fast, right? But you can see that the concepts are really, really basic math, right? We did nothing more complicated than some high school algebra. Even though we threw some matrices and vectors at it, once, once you get the rules, and once you recognize that if you make your dimensions line up according to the rules of the game, you're going to be OK, right? And with flux, what that means is that when I'm building something, let's do a multi-layer. I'm going to share screens one more second. I'm going to share the screens. Let's say that we are building something with three inputs and four outputs, and we want 10, uh, 10 columns in the hidden layer in between. So let's talk about how many inputs do we have? Three inputs and four total outputs, right? And we want two layers. So how many inputs does this does the first dense layer have? Three. Three, right? And then let's leave this in the middle. And then there's another dense layer. How many outputs did we say we wanted for the whole thing? Four. Four, right. Four total outputs, right? So all of the layers. So this is so I so basically all you have to do from this point on is make this you make this is the total number of inputs, this is the total number of outputs, and these. This number of outputs has to match the number of inputs, and they have to be the same. That's it. So we have built a complex neural network model with two layers, with some dense ones, with, with a hidden layer in the middle. Right? You can't tell the hidden layer because the, the, we're going to have three inputs and four outputs when we're done. Pretty much period, right? So if we call this FizzBuzz, So if that's FizzBuzz, I can get the params of that. I don't even need to know what all the WXs and Bs are, right? I can just say, give me the params of FizzBuzz. And I'm done. And the framework has to handle all the rest, 
right? So all you need to know as someone, as a practitioner of machine learning, essentially you have to have a high level understanding of what that dense layer does, w, uh, Wx plus B. And you have to know that it's dense, so it's fully connected. Every output of the previous layer is connected to the um, inputs of the next layer. That's it. Hey, Bruce, where, where do those, those numbers, like does dense just randomly generate those numbers that you were seeing? It does. And it turns out that that's important. It turns out that if you are, if, if you want better convergence, you get better convergence from a completely random model. And, and that's kind of what the dense function does or the dense model? Yeah. So it does, it does three things, right? First, it gives you convenient inputs for building a function, right? Second, it gives you a wrapper for all the parameters. And third, it fills everything up um, to start with, right? So it's- And then it's we iterate really, on those, those inputs and it, it just cycles through them until it converges into a, a, yeah. an estimation function. But when we work with our machine learning algorithm, Keith, we're not going to be working with each individual layer of the model. We're going to be saying, trainer, update it, period, right? Now, there are some things that there are some machine learning techniques where you say, hey, I'm going to train the first eight layers because that's really hair, hairy stuff, right? And it's going to take a long, long time. So for example, you can imagine a machine learning vision system. A lot of vision is being able to detect vertical lines, horizontal lines, edges, colors, things like that. Right? If you have all the things that learn how to detect those things, then you can deploy, you can apply that trained model to detecting elephants or people or boats or cars or parts on a conveyor belt or elements of the eye. Right? Corner is a corner, an edge is an edge. Those are features. Right? So what I do is I, I take hey, this whole first part is trained. Separate that from the whole thing, right? And then the rest, we'll, we'll apply the training only to the tail end of that. And that allows me to train with a much smaller set of data, right? And we'll get to that in Groxio's um, vision learning. And we'll probably do uh, a webinar on that once, um, you know, once we get a little bit closer. I'm curious what, uh, I mean, obviously these, um techniques apply plainly to numerical models. Yes. What if you're dealing with things that are more categorical, like, uh, you know, strings, uh, yeah, so you know, FizzBuzz, text kind of stuff? So FizzBuzz is a great example of a categorical um, data. So so this, this type of network, the neural network, was built for categorical data, right? So you can imagine me computing um, outputs of my layer and then saying, oh, take the biggest one and the smallest one and then kind of put even space between them and, um, and make that a probability, you know, normalize it to a number from zero to one for all those arguments. And now you have the probabilities for your vision layer, right? And there are a number of functions like um, softmax or um, logistic cross entropy. I mean, all of these are, are just functions that are pre-built and you just have to learn how to be a consumer of them, right? And so that's what Jose and Sean, is it Moriarty? I think that's right, um, that, that he's, he's working with, with right now, kind of, kind of building not just, the, um, not just kind of the demo that, that Jose showed. So J Jose showed MX plus B. Right, he showed a dense layer, and applied that to an image, which is not kind of the how you would normally solve the problem. What you would normally do is um, is there there are things things called um, like pooling layers and convergence layers and and things like that that you would basically tie together, right? So you basically have one model that knows how to scan down the image, and then another one that pools those images. Like maybe one layer counts the number of horizontal edges, right? And then you basically uh, pull all those things together into a vision recognition um, library. 
So I think we're on the right track. Um, and if this continues to grow, if we can grow up to a regular attendance of 100 or so, we'll keep doing it. We've just really enjoyed this first Groxio Monthly. We've been putting it together for a long time, and I hope you did too.